Goedenavond. Goedenavond, dit is de Wereld weer door van dinsdag 4 februari. Vanavond hebben we een speciale uitzending van DWDD Heimwee. Hier is Adriaan van Dis. We hebben het zes keer eerder gedaan. De laatste keer in 2018 en dat zou echt de allerlaatste keer zijn. Stephen Fry was toen je gast, je gedroomde gast. We namen afscheid van elkaar. En toen zei je, als die schrijver zou willen komen, doe ik het nog één keer. En die is er. Yuval Noah Harari. Ja. Een van de grote denkers van dit ogenblik... En die denkt na over de toekomst met voeding uit een ver verleden. En het gaat ons aan mm -hmm. waar je over denkt. Jij het gaat onze kinderen aan, onze kindskinderen, over machines die meer weten van ons dan wij van onszelf. Jij bent je nu een paar maanden aan het onderdompelen in dat ja. oeuvre. Wat doet dat met jou? Honderden feiten in mijn hoofd, fantastische geschiedenissen en verhalen. Alleen maar aantekeningen gemaakt van, hé, hey, dat kan ik later nog eens gebruiken. Ik kan het waarschijnlijk nu niet gebruiken, mm -hmm. maar mijn hoofd loopt over van de feiten. En ik durf mijn hoofd niet eens scheef te houden als de dood er eruit loopt. Ben je klaar? Ja. Hier is Adriaan van Dis. <applaus> Yuval Noah Harari is een van de meest invloedrijke denkers ter wereld. World Economic Forum in Davos, Google... IMF, Barack Obama, Bill Gates, Angela Merkel... het zijn niet de geringste die zijn boeken prijzen. De 43-jarige Yuval Harari is hoogleraar geschiedenis... aan de Hebreeuwse Universiteit van Jeruzalem. Hij verweer wereldvaar met drie boeken... die in bijna 50 talen zijn vertaald... en een oplage van meer dan 12 miljoen. Sapiens, hoe een onbetekenende aap... evolueerde tot heerser op planeet aarde. Homo Deus, over de toekomst... hoe mensen mogelijk goden kunnen worden als ze zich met artificiële intelligentie weten op te waarderen. En zijn meest recente boek, 21 lessen voor de 21ste eeuw... waarin hij de problemen en uitdagingen van nu analyseert. We gaan er vrolijk en ernstig over praten. En alle mensen die nu klaarzitten met hun smartphone in de WhatsApp-modus... dit gaat over u, over uw belabberde concentratie... en de machine die u de baas is. Ik vraag drie kwartier aandacht voor Yuval Noah Harari. It's a privilege to have you here. Uh, thank you, it's, it's an honor. It's a tradition that we kill some brain cells during the conversation. We drink water and wine. For you? What? Uh, water. Water. Yeah. Okay. Well. <laughs> well, here, there's a glass already done. There you are. Thank you. It's lukewarm water. Yeah, it's hot. Why? Water. The Dalai Lama drinks lukewarm water. No, it's just good for the throat. I good talk too much, so you know. <laughs> okay, well, then I drink water from a kind of solidarity. Um, I read your books. Here, that's the proof. It's all in my head. There must be a lot of books in your head. Will we be able to hack your mind or your brains? Um, some of it, I guess, yes. But uh, I don't know. We are hackable. Yes. I mean, as a species, we, sh we should get used to the idea that we are no longer mysterious souls. We are really now hackable animals. Um, you know, throughout history, lots of people, organizations, governments dreamt about hacking human beings. To hack a human being means to understand people better than they understand themselves. To know more about you than you know about yourself and therefore be able to predict uh, your decisions and feelings and to manipulate and control you. Um, this is what Stalin dreamt about and Hitler and the Catholic Church and so many. And it never worked. With it the... was impossible yeah. because there was no technology to do that. Uh, you know, in the Soviet Union, you couldn't follow everybody all the time. Even Stalin and the KGB couldn't do it. You don't have 200 million agents to follow 200 million people 24 hours a day. And even if you do that, then these agents, they would just, you know, write paper reports where you go, who you meet, what you do, and they send these reports to Moscow. And then somebody needs to read all these paper reports and write more paper reports, and that's impossible. But now, or in a few years, it will be possible to systematically hack all the people because you don't need human agents to follow everybody around. 
you have sensors and microphones and cameras and smartphones. It's the first time in history that you can follow everybody all the time. And the resulting information, you don't need people to analyze it. You have artificial intelligence and algorithms. So we are very close to the point when it will become possible to monitor everybody all the time and then also to know you better than you know yourself. So that means life is one big job interview. Everything that the machine knows can be held against you. Yes. Um, you know, in 10 years, you go to a job interview for whatever, and they don't want your CV. They don't even want your job interview. It's unnecessary. I mean, today, if I want to hire somebody for a job, I publish an ad, a hundred people answer, I choose the 10 best CVs, I invite them for a job interview, 10 minutes, and I try to assess their personality or whatever. That's, you know, very inefficient. Um, in 10 years, or even today in some places, you don't need all that. You just mine their data. You have an algorithm that goes over their Facebook feed, their Instagram account, data from many places, and based on that, you can know their personality type, their political views, their sexual preferences, and the algorithm chooses uh, who to hire for a job, so we, which means that anything you do at any time is really part of the job interview. But what that has a horrible effect on our personal life because we don't dare to do anything, not, not make mistakes because in the end... Technology always gives us options. You can use the same technology to create very different kinds of societies. You can use radio and electricity and trains to build a communist dictatorship or a liberal democracy. The trains don't care. They'll do what you do with them. So it's the same with AI. You can use AI and surveillance uh, for corporations and governments to monitor people, citizens. And you can use the same technology the opposite way uh, to, for citizens to monitor the government. That there is no corruption, for example. So uh, it's not, all these things are not prophecies, they are not inevitable, but we need to be aware of them to make the right decisions now and in the coming years. Let's be positive. Uh, I wouldn't mind to go to an, a doctor with artificial intelligence on his side. Mm -hmm. he, he know, then he knows, then you have a double doctor, don't you? Yeah, I mean, for some things, already AI is better than human doctors, for example, in diagnosing diseases. I mean, to diagnose a disease is basically to process a lot of data and recognize patterns. What are the biological patterns characteristic of flu or uh, lung cancer or whatever? And this is something that, for some things already today, for many things in a few years, AI will be better than most humans, even all humans, in diagnosing these diseases. So you don't need uh, human doctors anymore for that. You need them for other things. And I'm totally in favor of it. I don't think that the technology is bad. It can do enormous good for humanity, not just better healthcare, but much cheaper healthcare. You know, to train a human doctor it takes a lot of time, maybe 10 years, a lot of money, and at the end, you just get one doctor. And there are many people, places in the world where there are not enough doctors. Uh, with AI, once you train a single AI to diagnose a particular disease or a range of diseases, you get not just one doctor, you get an infinite number of doctors available everywhere all the time. The positive possibilities are enormous, I find myself most of the time talking about the more dystopian and more frightening scenarios simply because there are enough people, the entrepreneurs, uh, the, the engineers, the business people, that they focus on all the positive scenarios in order to convince people that it's all okay, you don't need to worry, and please invest in us. So they constantly focus on the positive scenarios. Or it lets them focus on the dark scenarios. And then, you know, as a historian and philosopher, it's my job to warn people that, yes, there is a lot of wonderful opportunities, but we should also be worried about the dangerous uh, scenarios. One speaks nowadays in the newspaper some an artificial intelligence race, like an arms race. Yeah. There is now, and, and you know, five years ago, almost nobody talked about AI, except a few scientists and entrepreneurs. Over the last three, four years, 
uh, people all over the world, and especially governments, realized that uh, this is likely to be the dominant technology of, of the 21st century. Whoever leads in AI would be in a position to dominate the global economy and even the global political system. And we've now entered into a very dangerous arms race, with the two leading countries being China and the US. Most countries left far, far behind. Europe? Europe has a chance of being a third player if it moves fast and if it moves as a united force and not every country to itself. It so, still has a chance, but the window of opportunities is, is, is closing. I would very much like to see Europe as a third force because the competition between China and the US is really now a competition between state surveillance and surveillance capitalism whether you're being hacked by the government or by some big corporation. And both options are far from ideal. So I would be happy to see Europe as a third option. But we don't have a Huawei, we, we don't yeah. have a Google. Of the 20 big companies in this field, none is, is European. It's, it's mostly uh, a competition now between China and the US. That's very dangerous, not just for Europe, but for the whole world. It's basically the danger is a repetition of the 19th century industrial revolution. During that time, a few countries industrialized first, like Britain and France and Japan and the US. They went on to conquer and exploit most of the world. Many countries suffered terribly. As a result, some countries like China took about 150 years to close the gap that opened in the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century. Many countries didn't close it even today. It could happen again with AI, and it is likely to be even worse. I mean, in the 19th century, with the previous round of imperialism, the basic economic model of imperialism is that you harvest uh, raw materials in the colonies, maybe cotton, maybe rubber, maybe metals, whatever, you send the raw materials to the mother country, where the really sophisticated industry is. There they make the finished goods, which are sold back to the colony. Now we are seeing it happening with data. You harvest the raw material uh, all over the world, the data of people. You send it to the imperial hub. There they make the really sophisticated tools, like an AI doctor, and you send it then back uh, to, the, to the data colonies. Shouldn't we open a bottle of wine? <laughs> I mean, this is... How do we cope with this? Um, there, are, there are ways to cope. Again, I don't want to sound like apocalyptic. No, not, not, at, not... All, not <laughs> at all. Not at all. The main thing is it's, it's dangerous, <laughs> yeah. but it's not inevitable. It's not a prophecy. It depends on the decisions we take in the coming years. You know, part of what I try to do is to change the public conversation That's and what you do make indeed. people realize that, you know, now you have an election campaign, so the top subjects are terrorism, immigration, things like that. So I try to tell people, yes, it's, it's, it's important. And is that why you're traveling around the world to talk with everybody? On YouTube, go to, to International Monetary Fund, you really have a message? Mostly, you know, it, it's, it's, the mission is to change the public conversation. But how strange, because you are a professor in history mm -hmm. and uh, Middle Ages and Crusaders, that was your speciality. Yeah. <laughs> well, we know we can't learn anything from the past, but we probably can learn something from the future. No, we can learn a lot from the past, but not like history will repeat itself. This never works. History almost never repeats itself we can use the past to open our minds to see more possibilities for the future. People are often trapped in the present and they are able to see just a very narrow spectrum of future possibilities because they are conditioned by the, uh, by the present or the, or, the, or the near past. And as you learn more and more history, you realize that there are many more possibilities out there. So I try to use history not in order to kind of uh, uh, reach a, con a, a prophecy that this is what is going to happen in the future, but just the opposite, to enlarge 
to enlarge the spectrum of possibilities that you see before you. Um, because history is very, very unexpected. We tend to think about it like as linear, whatever happened in the last 10 years will just continue to happen. And it almost never works like but that. But things, because all your books deal with change and things go very fast now. We have uh, disruptive technologies mm -hmm. and you even say that a, a twin revolution awaits us. Yeah. In information technology, that's data, and biological technology, genetic engineering. Mm -hmm. Now, the data we just talked about, genetic engineering, what does it mean? That we can become a mortal and just have a a chip in our body and breathe better in a polluted world? Not in the next 20 or 40 years, oh. but I would emphasize that the biotech revolution, it's oh. not just genetics and it's not separate from the uh, infotech revolution. They actually go together. Um, AI can't go very far without biometric sensors and an understanding of biology. People think about computers and biology as two different revolutions, but they are actually now merging and we really haven't seen anything yet with AI and surveillance because until today, yes, AI was kind of uh, surveying what we do, where we go, what we say, but it didn't go into our body. The real big revolution, which will happen in five, ten years or so, is when infotech and biotech unite and uh, the data which feeds the computer no longer comes just from our smartphones and just from our credit cards. It starts coming from within our bodies. That's the really big revolution. I mean, we really... So the real enemy is inside? Enemy and friend. I mean, once, you know, with biometric sensors, already you have people who walk with rings or, or, or uh, these devices, bracelets, that constantly measure your blood pressure, your heartbeat, even your brain activity. Uh, you can now tell, tell somebody's uh, blood pressure just from afar by looking at your face and recognizing tiny changes in color in your face, it indicates changes in blood pressure. So you don't even have to wear it. Uh, you can track eye movements. So I often give the example uh, um, what something people don't know about themselves that somebody else can know, like sexual preference, sexual orientation. Uh, it was only when I was 21 that I realized I was gay after several years that I was living in denial, basically. And then you met a machine? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, but in the future, hmm? or teenagers now might meet a machine or the machine meets them that can tell them their sexual orientation, not when you're 21, but when you're 15 or 14, just, for example, by tracking eye movements. So like, but that means that the machine actually is, it knows much better what partner to choose for you than, you than yourself. What partner or what commercial to show you? Like if I'm Coca-Cola and I want to sell a 15-year-old teenager some sweet drink and I can choose to show you the advertisement with the shirtless guy or the advertisement with the girl in the bikini. And if I know that you're gay, even before you know that, I will choose the one with the shirtless guy. And you don't even know why, but next day when you go to the shop, your hand reaches for that battle. And um, that, 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 that is worth billions. Now, of course, if you're not Coca-Cola, if you are the Iranian police and there is a death penalty for homosexuality in Iran, then this goes in much, towards much darker uh, destinations. They sell 10% less Coca-Cola. <laughs> and they sell less Coca-Cola in <laughs> Iran, yes. <laughs> but the thing is that it's not just computers. It's computers plus biology. Oh, just think about, you know, self-driving vehicles. Everybody now talking about self-driving vehicles. You can't put a self-driving vehicle on the road without understanding, without allowing the computer to understand human beings, human emotions. Uh, the self-driving vehicle needs to tell the difference between a human teenager and an elderly person, between a drunk person and a sober person, between an angry person and a joyful person. Otherwise, it can't deal with the pedestrians, with the passengers. So even self-driving cars, they will need to understand human emotions, which really means understand human biology. So philosophy is finished and it's now the engineering department and biologists. I think philosophy is more important than ever before because we have more and more philosophical questions 
that for thousands of years, philosophers discussed uh, without much impact on human life, but now they are becoming engineering problems. Yeah. Like you have this, uh, uh, you know, a self-driving car, uh, two kids jump before the car, the car can swerve to the side, but then it runs over two elderly people. Yeah, what you have should to the make a choice. Do? Well, kill the old ones. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, for thousands of years, philosophers argued about it, but it had no impact on how people actually behaved because, you know, you can say that this is the right thing to do, but in the moment of crisis, you don't act from your intellect, you basically act from your gut emotions. Uh, but with a self-driving vehicle, you can take, I don't know, a committee of the best philosophers in the world, make them discuss it, come up with an answer, you program the algorithm accordingly, and you have a 100% guarantee that in the moment of truth, the algorithm will do what the philosophers said which is never the case with humans. So you need philosophers more, but also they have far greater responsibility. You know, throughout history, philosophers could discuss things and comfort themselves with the thought that, well, you know, in any case, people won't do what I tell them. So what does it matter so much? But now it becomes crucial, and maybe, I don't know, maybe in 20 years, you can sue the philosopher afterwards if, if, the, <laughs> if the decision is, is wrong. Yeah. And it's the same as politicians. You know, politicians until today, they pass laws, and in the back of their heads, they are thinking, well, you know, if it's, it's not the best law in the world, in any case, most laws are not being enforced. You very seldom hear politicians talk about this. They, they, you say if, if a politician doesn't have an answer on artificial intelligence or biotech, infotech, don't vote for him. Uh, I think we need to ask politicians, hey, what's your vision? for humanity in 2050, how do you see these powers of AI and biotech and genetics, what will we do with them? And if the politicians don't offer any vision for the future, they just have, I don't know, nostalgic fantasies about the past. Yeah, but that's then... what we witness all the times. Now. I mean, there is nationalism on the rise because mm -hmm. people want to go back to where we were. And uh, so what do we do? We build walls, medieval stone walls. We close frontiers, Brexit. Yeah. Uh, is that a reaction? Because it's going, as I said, give me a bottle of red wine. <laughs> Let's go back to the Middle Ages because we can't cope with it. Partly it is a reaction. Um, you know, like lo you lose your way, you're going somewhere. You lose your way, you don't know where you are. You say, okay, let's go back to the last place where I knew where I am. And this is part of what is happening now. Uh, we are seeing very rapid changes over, over the world, uh, technology, economics, society. Uh, the future is completely mysterious. We can't see 10, 20 years to the future. It's the first time in history that nobody knows what the job market would look in 20 years. So we don't even know what to teach kids today because we don't know what skills they will need. And the gut reaction of many people is, this is too much, let's go back to a place where we, we knew where we are. So you have all these nostalgic fantasies. How do we prepare our children uh, for the future? What do we tell them? Tell them that it's all sunshine or give them these gloomy dystopian views and read these books and you'll smile in your life? Um, because I think the best preparation is just watch your iPhone the whole day. <laughs> That's what they're all doing. Uh, I think we need to be honest. Yeah and tell them that A, we don't really know, B, we are leaving them with the world in a so-so situation. We didn't do such a great job. We didn't do a terrible job either. The world today is in much better shape. Humanity is in much better shape than a century ago, in 1920. So we have accomplishments and we need to be uh, grateful and uh, even proud of some of these accomplishments. I think that part of the problem today uh, is that many people just take it for granted. Uh, the accomplishments, like the peace in Europe, you know, in all the Brexit debate, you heard very little about uh, the terrible history of violence in Europe and how the European Union managed to bring peace to Europe. You know, lots of things about the economy, but uh, you can't take the peace in Europe for granted. 
So you need to be aware of what has been accomplished and, 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 and protect it. But at the same time, we also need to be honest that we just don't know. One of the uh, things we don't know, for example, but you write a lot about it, is the fact that if we become a mortal, it, it will be an, an upper class, a kind of super caste of human beings that will be able to upgrade themselves. Yeah, even long before our mortality, yeah. like overcoming death, there are going to be a lot of improvements to human health and to human skills. Human but not abilities, for everybody, not when you which, live... Which, exactly, could be very expensive. Yeah. So we might see the most unequal societies in history there in the are. sense that we will have not just economic inequality, but for the first time in history, economic inequality could be translated into biological inequality. So you begin a class of irrelevant people will be created. Uh, not only irrelevant people, but only also people with really uh, uh, lower skills. You know, in the Middle Ages and throughout history, the rich and powerful, the aristocracy, always imagined that they have superior abilities, they are superior people. This is why they enjoy all these luxuries and power. And this wasn't true. There was no real difference in basic abilities between the daughter of the king and the daughter of the peasant, or the daughter of the king and the son of the king. They had basically the same abilities. But in a couple of decades, there could be real differences in ability between the rich and the poor. And once such a gap opens, it becomes almost impossible to close it because the, the rich uh, 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 monopolize even more and more power and wealth, which they use to improve themselves even further. And within a very short time, Homo sapiens undergoes speciation, really uh, uh, diverges or separates into different human species, which was once the past, or which was once the case. You know, if you go back 50,000 years ago, you find Earth populated by at least six different human species. Our ancestors, Homo sapiens, lived in East Africa. Uh, here and in Europe lived Neanderthals. And they were very different. And eventually Homo sapiens took over and exterminated all the other human species with a little intermingling. But we are used to the situation where there is just one human species all over the world. But that will change. But that could change. Isn't this all science fiction? Um, we need to be very careful when we talk about these things to separate science fiction from scientific reality. Uh, personally, I like science fiction very much, but very often science fiction fills people with uh, completely impossible scenarios, and then they worry about those instead of on the uh, realistic scenarios. For example, if you talked earlier about the job market, so there are many science fiction movies, books, about the robots rebelling against the humans. I think this is science fiction. It's not going to happen anytime soon. But uh, robots replacing humans in more and more jobs and therefore creating a huge useless class, that's a realistic scenario we need to worry about. Uh, you know, robots, the problem with them is that they will never rebel. If you think about robot soldiers, then they are not going to rebel no, no matter what you're going to tell them, and that's the problem. With a human army... But there's machine learning, they can become more intelligent. Uh, yes, but the key is not intelligence, the key is consciousness. Whether they have feelings and desires of their own or not. In, again, in science fiction, there is a lot of confusion between intelligence and consciousness. Now, intelligence is the ability to solve problems. Consciousness is the ability to feel things like pain and pleasure and love and hate. In science fiction, it's often assumed that once computers and robots reach a certain level of intelligence, they will also miraculously gain consciousness and start having feelings of their own. And 95% of the plots of these movies focus on the miraculous moment when the robot gains consciousness and then either the scientist falls in love with the robot or the robot tries to kill all the humans or both things happen at the same time. 
And this is, this is science fiction. Uh, we don't see any indication that computers and robots are anywhere on the road to developing consciousness. Uh, because, you know, mammals solve problems by having feelings. In us, intelligence and consciousness are linked. And feelings are real things. I mean, it's not a biochemical process we call feeling. No, the real thing, the actual feeling. This is how we make decisions about everything from what uh, stock to invest in the stock market to what politicians to vote for, to whom to date and whom to marry. We make decisions through our feelings. Now, computers make decisions in a completely different way. And there is no indication that yeah, they can become super intelligent without ever developing feelings because they make decisions in a different way. You know, it's like airplanes today fly much, much faster than birds and they never developed feathers. They just fly in a different way. So computers make decisions about, you know, recommending to you who to vote for, who to date, who to hire for a job without any feelings in a, in a different way. And going back to science fiction, my impression is that all these movies about robots gaining consciousness and what happens then, they are not really about the human fear of uh, intelligent robots. In most cases, they're actually about the male fear of intelligent women. Because if you look at these movies, in most cases, the robots that gain consciousness are female somehow. I don't know how robots can have a gender, but usually they are female. And the scientist who falls in love with the robot is male. And the real question these movies uh, deal with is not what happens when robots are more intelligent than humans, but what happens when women are more intelligent than men? Nothing. <laughs> because it's a normal thing. But you say, uh, and you stress upon it once and again, stories will save us. We need stories. In the 21st century, uh, Fiction might become the most potent force on Earth. Yeah, because the real power of humanity comes from large-scale cooperation. You look at any big project, building the pyramids or flying to the moon or building an atom bomb, you need a lot of people cooperating. To build an atom bomb, it's not enough to know nuclear physics. You need millions of people to build reactors and mine uranium and grow wheat to feed the miners and the workers? How do you get lots of people to cooperate? It's always the same answer. You tell them a story and convince everybody to believe in the same story. It almost never works with, you know, you can't get millions of people to cooperate by telling them that E equals MC square. So what? Einstein. That, that's, that's a bad uh, religion, that's a bad ideology, not because it's not true, but because it doesn't motivate people. Um, throughout history, the key for power and large-scale cooperation is telling stories. That's the basis for political ideologies, that's the basis for religion. You know, uh, you can't get a million chimpanzees to cooperate by promising them that, look, if you come and help me build this huge temple, uh, after you die, you go to chimpanzee heaven, and there you get lots of bananas and uh, whatever. No chimpanzee will ever believe that. But humans believe such things. <laughs> and that's why we control the world and not the chimpanzees. You know, even religious people would agree that all religions are fake news except one. Mine, of course. You know, you go to a Jew and you ask her, and so you will say, yes, Judaism is the truth, but Christianity, all these stories about Jesus, eh, that's all fake news, it's all fiction. You go to the Christian, he will say, no, 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 that's the truth. But Islam, all that, th th that's, that's complete fiction. And then so forth and so on. So that's the basis for large-scale cooperation, which is the basis for human power. And that's how fake news came into the world, with the first scriptures. Uh, as far as we know, again, even religious people, I'd be very careful here, even religious Don't people would agree that most scriptures in the world are not true. There is just one exception, uh, my scriptures. <laughs> and it's, it's interesting how much you talk about religion and God. I mean, that must have something to do with your background. I mean, you call Israel a myth factory. 
Yeah, the, the whole Middle East, you know, yeah. it's the biggest myth factory in, in, in the world, in human history. And so, then you talk about the God, the different gods, the mystery God, the lawgiver God, the God that forbids. When I use the word God, I think of the God of the Islamic State, of crusade, inquisition, and of the God hates facts banners. Mm -hmm. You're very open about homosexuality. Why is that so important? Or to be open about it. Um, or, or both. Or both. I mean, it's, it's a good example. It's a good yeah. story. <laughs> you know, um, it clarifies... It's more things. than a story. It's an erection too. <laughs> uh. No, talking about it. Oh, talking about it. Okay. Is, is a good story. I know because it's so... It's one of these things that is so crystal clear. Hmm. When you think about it for th so much hatred and violence and misery for thousands of years, and about what? You know, um, even if there is a God, I don't think that God would punish humans for love. That's, that's a completely human idea, to punish people for loving each other. So for me, it's one of the clearest examples. You see the power of fictional stories that when you give it like a moment's thought, it seems completely crazy. You know, other things to, to, to fight over territory or over food, I can under, you can, we can understand it. I'm hungry, you're hungry, there is just one apple, so we fight about it. That's understandable. But you look at something like the persecutions of LGBT people throughout history, and you think, this is completely crazy. I mean, there is absolutely no rationale behind it, except some story that people in the Middle East came up with a few thousand years ago, and that began to spread and contaminate more and more parts of the world. And it's going to be any better. Because if, if, if everything is a story, religions are a story, we see also a rise of fundamentalism. Mm -hmm. And not only in Islam, but Christian fundamentalism, mm -hmm. orthodoxy everywhere. Is that also a reaction? I think we shouldn't exaggerate. When we talk about the kind of rise of fundamentalism and nationalism, Again, we should have an historical perspective and realize that, yes, we see now a wave in the last few years, but it's nothing like what it was in the past. Religion now is far, far weaker than in previous eras. Um, in previous eras, religion was everywhere. Every, you know, you, you go, you, you're sick, you go to the priest, not to the doctor. There is not enough rain, there is not enough food, you go to the temple to do some ceremony. Today, even with the religious people in places like, I don't know, Iran or Israel, when they are sick, they go to the doctor, not to the rabbi or the mullah. When there is not enough rain, they go to the engineers. The, uh, the sphere in which religion is important has been shrinking rapidly over the last few centuries. And it's the same with people talking about the rise of nationalism. Nationalism today, certainly in Europe, is far, far weaker than it was a century or two ago. You know, a century ago, Europeans were killing each other by the million in national conflicts. But we read in the papers every day about terrorism and fundamentalism, and you call it a, a, a theater of terror? Terrorism is basically theater. I mean, you look at the numbers, uh, certainly in the West, the place where terrorism is really serious is mostly within the Islamic world, where it kills thousands of people every year. In the West, more people die from nut allergy than from terrorism. We should deal with the nuts before we are dealing with the, with the terrorists. And Coca-Cola is worse than Al-Qaeda. Yeah, much, much. I mean, you know, the number of people, uh, there are hundreds of people, hundreds of thousands of people die each year from uh, diabetes and from uh, uh, obesity-related diseases. The number of people who die from terrorism in the West is maybe a couple of dozens every year. So sugar is a far, far greater threat to your life, uh, at least in the West, than Al-Qaeda and, and, and all these terrorists. And the terrorists work because they are good, uh, uh, they're good at theater at capturing our imagination. They stage these immense spectacles of violence, and then the media jumps on it and shows it again and again and again, and you think the end of the world is coming. And um, they are really hijacking our imagination and using it against us. Usually the terrorists are actually very, very weak 
I often compare them to like, you know, like a, a mosquito that tries to destroy a china shop. How does a mosquito destroy a china shop? It's so weak, it can't move even a single glass. So the, the method is, it finds an elephant, goes into its ear, start buzzing, and the elephant goes wild and destroys everything. This is what Al-Qaeda did to the Americans. You know, Al-Qaeda couldn't destroy the order in the Middle East, but it got into the ear of the American elephant and the elephant destroyed it for them. You know, the problem with these great stories you tell us, they are too difficult to understand. Not because they are difficult, because the truth is too difficult to understand. And that's why still the majority of biology teachers in the United States does not accept evolution theory. That's yeah. why uh, on Google, the flat earth theory is rising. <laughs> and they even advise you watching it mm -hmm. by the billions. That's why in French school books nowadays, they say the CIA bombed their own twin towers in, the, in New York. Mm. That's yeah. myth. That's the stories you want. Uh, the thing is that the truth is often complicated and inconvenient, even painful. Whereas when you create a fiction, you can make it very simple and very flattering and appealing. In almost every country, a politician who would tell the voters the, tr the truth about the history of their country will never be elected. Because it's too painful, too unpleasant to contemplate who we really are. Um, but to a large extent, we need to make this effort. Um, because of the immense powers that we are acquiring now, and we discussed uh, earlier, it's more important than ever to know the truth about ourselves, especially about our own dark side, our own weaknesses. If you just flatter people, then yes, they will vote for you, but then they will have a very distorted view of themselves, on the level of a country, on the level of, of, the, of the entire species. And um, we should get used to the idea that we are now basically the gods of planet Earth. We have now divine powers of creation and destruction, and we need to be responsible gods. And for that, we need to understand who we really are, and especially what our weaknesses are. And you especially deal with that with 21st, uh, 21 lessons for the 21st century. What lesson brought writing these books to you on a personal level? What I learned personally yeah. from, from writing the books, from the... Yeah, and talking about it and travelling around the world and meeting uh, political leaders. That um, really nobody is in charge. There are no adults in the room. That nobody knows where we are heading to. The leaders... Most of the political and business leaders, and it's understandable, they are preoccupied by the immediate problems and concerns of their country, by this crisis, that crisis, the coming elections. They uh, don't even have the time to just take a break from all these immediate concerns and think, OK, where will we actually be in 20 or 30 years? So it's not it's very soon, 20, 30 years. Hmm? It's not, not a very long time. It's not, no, and the, again, it's not like science fiction scenarios for a thousand years from now. Again, if you think about the job market, nobody knows how the job market would look like in 2050, in, in 30 years. And the problem is that, you know, in some areas, you can wait 30 years and then see what happens and react. But in some areas, like education, you can't wait. I mean, when you decide what to teach kids today in school, you need to think, what will they actually need in 20 or 30 years? You can't wait and see and then, and then go back in time and change the curriculum. And what do they need, an open mind? Uh, because we don't know what the job market would look like, focusing on any particular skill could be a, a wrong bet. So the best bet is to focus on the very ability to learn and to change, and to change, really, to kind of reinvent yourself again and again throughout your life. This is something that people will need. Uh, the problem is it's much more difficult to teach people 
how to keep an open mind than to teach people the dates of some battle in history or an equation in physics. What, how do you do it? Because I, we all know, well, at least in your books you talk about it, you, meditation. Mm -hmm. uh, I do it. Um, it kills my rage. <laughs> but it also kills your creativity because you become loving kindness. And the great thing about your books <laughs> is that you, irony is mm. one of your strong uh, tones and you fight with words. What does meditation do to you? I... Uh, for me, uh, it brings clarity uh, and focus to my work. And I don't think that, you know, meditation makes people, or should make people inactive. You just sit in a cave and observe your breath and I don't care what happens to the world. Uh, it but you do it two months a year. I go on long meditation retreats, but the aim is really to clarify the mind and develop uh, uh, compassion, develop a better understanding of, of myself and on the world so that after a month or two, you go back out and you can act uh, much more, in a much more positive and, and beneficial way. You know, even if you want to change something in the world, if your own mind is very muddled and you can't focus or you don't see reality clearly, your ability to act would be uh, diminished, would be m much less. Well, it was an overwhelming experience and people will be surprised reading the subtitles of our conversation. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.